So the, the agenda is, I'll go over a little bit about some, what we mean by resources and then OEO will talk and then we'll have some architects talk. And throughout both of those, you can ask questions, use the chat, use the Q and A feature. Um, but then at the end, we're gonna have some final Q and A time. So if you don't think of a question until later, that's totally fine, we'll still have space. And then we will close it out, MCH will close it out looking ahead a little bit to 2022. Okay, so resources. So we are going to be compiling a list of architects that have agreed to be a resource. So we'll share that in emails, we'll put it on our website. But if you want that information earlier than when we send it out, you can email me directly and I can send you what, you, what we have at that moment. It'll grow throughout the year, but I can at least send you some initial ones. Um, another resource, DLR, uh, they are going to be the architect speaking speakers that will be during today's event. There's also what's called the American Institute of Architects, if you want to peruse their uh, website. And most architects in Minnesota are a part of that as well. But then there's also already on Minnesota Housing on their website, there the website that's listed on the slide here, if you go to that, the very first paragraph on that page, there's a hyperlink titled previously submitted qualification forms. You can actually download that, turns into a spreadsheet, and you'll get a list of architects, developers, general contractors. And we think that's just a good list because they have been vetted or gone through the process, at least through Minnesota Housing. So that's what we mean when we say resources. So uh, I am going to hand it off to um, Caitlin and Francie to talk about some uh, upcoming funding. Take it away. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you everyone for making the time to join this afternoon. I know there's no shortage of things going on, but we're really excited to be here with you today to continue some really important conversations about shelter capital and infrastructure needs. And so uh, thank you to the coalition for, for coordinating the session and the DLR group for, for joining. So I am here with Francie from our office, from the Office of Economic Opportunity or OEO to talk about a specific upcoming funding opportunity for emergency shelters. So my name is Caitlin Warburton. For those of you who are recipients of or familiar with the State Emergency Services Program or ESP or the Balance of State Emergency Solutions Grant Funds, ESG, um, we may have had an opportunity to meet in the past. I see a lot of familiar names in the chat. So excited to be here with you today. And Francie Mathis, the OEO director will be presenting with me today as well. So I'll pass it off to Francie. Hi everyone, I'm delighted to be here. This is really an exciting opportunity for, for us and something long awaited. So we're really excited to have this opportunity to um, share this information with you and then there will be ongoing information to come. So Caitlin and I have been working really hard um, to put this out, but it is our first time. So we're hoping that you all have some grace um, for us if we um, goof in any way. I've already warned everybody, but um, we're giving it our best shot and we just want to be sure that whatever we're saying today and when we go forward, um, that we will be as clear as possible. Thanks. So during today's conversation, we um, intend to walk through the following components related to these funds. So we'll discuss the funding details, the specifics of the amount and the funding type, of course, walk through eligible applicants and activities, walk through the timeline, both for the eligible use window of the funds, as well as what we're proposing as a timeline for the RFP process and funding distribution. Also try to give some tips on preparation or just some thoughts on what you can be doing at this time. And lastly, we'll definitely have some space for question and answer. And just to highlight, Francie did mention this, but these funds are new uh, to our office. And so we're definitely still working through the RFP and the contracting process with our legal team. So there are likely going to be some questions you all have today 
that we can't answer, but we will do our best to either follow up or ensure that those are shared in a future uh, Frequently Asked Questions document. So before we dive in, I just want to give a little bit more context of the OEO team who will be managing these funds. So um, for those of you who we haven't had the chance to work with, the Office of Economic Opportunity Shelter and Housing team grants directly with community-based service providers, um, traditionally for services and operations funds for street outreach, shelter, short medium-term housing options, um, for youth singles and families. And so the list of grant programs that we traditionally work with are on the screen. So again, ESP and ESG, as well as Safe Harbor Fund, Shelter Linked Mental Health, THP, Homeless Youth Act, and a few others as they pop up. So um, again, this will be new for our office in terms of managing uh, capital funds, but definitely uh, for those of you who we've connected with in these other grant spaces, we're excited for this new opportunity. So there will be a total of $17 million available that we'll be talking about with shelter capital funds. And just to acknowledge that that, of course, will not fully meet the need, but excited for the potential of these funds. So $15 million of that is federal recovery funds. So a portion from the rescue plan resources that the governor had some discretion over and an additional 2 million of emergency shelter grants that were appropriated during the previous legislative session. So the 15 million is one time in nature, whereas the 2 million will be ongoing uh, a million per year moving forward. But these funds together will be put out in a competitive RFP for 17 million. Eligible applicants will include nonprofit organizations, local units of governments, so cities and counties and tribal governments providing emergency shelter services, either currently operating an emergency shelter or having operated a somewhat comparable homeless service program looking to expand into shelter services. Next slide. Oh, I have a barking dog, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, shelter, um, so uh, again, those eligible applicants would need to be providing or intending to provide emergency shelter to um, individuals and or families experiencing homelessness. Shelter, of course, can be a little bit tricky to define, um, especially when we're, you know, wanting to make sure we're pursuing and supporting a variety of shelter models. But for the purposes of these funds, we do need to put some parameters on what uh, shelter would mean. So traditionally, we would refer to that as a space in which singles or families could stay on a short term basis. Um, traditionally, we've identified that as three months, although we definitely recognize during the pandemic that length of stay has, has been extended quite significantly. So just to flag that, but the purpose of the space is intended to provide a temporary living situation in which a housing status doesn't change for an individual. And so offering, um, you know, shell, um, excuse me, showers, beds, meals, etc as well as some other supportive services. And that can be in a variety of models, either a congregate or a site-based facility, scattered site, uh, for example, if um, that could be like emergency apartments or a hotel motel setting. So shelter projects that would further qualify would be required to be proposing an activity that would support mitigation measures intended to reduce infectious disease transmission within a shelter. So the activities that are eligible would be acquisition, renovation, and planning and design. So acquisition, of course, would mean the purchasing of property of an existing space, for example, a hotel or motel. Renovation could include everything from improving the condition of a space or completing some deferred maintenance or configuring a space to better meet public health needs, etc. And planning and design, we wanted to make sure and make this allowable, given that for many shelter providers, delving into capital projects is either a new thing or a component that perhaps stretches folks beyond capacity. And so this planning and design eligibility category would allow for providers to bring on 
a TA provider or a consultant to both assist in preparing the project for submission or for application, as well as seeing the project through. So we wanted to provide some examples just to get people thinking in case you don't already have a project in mind. So some things to consider would be updating an HVAC system or ensuring that windows in a space can open. Um, we know in some older facilities operating a shelter, sometimes windows have been painted over and, and they're no longer able to open or there aren't adequate windows for airflow. So things like that or updating a current ventilation system, updating the materials within a room to ensure that uh, spaces can be adequately clean and sanitized remodeling a room to um, allow for um, extra bedrooms or excuse me, extra bathroom space or additional shower space or hand washing stations, things like that. Again, the purchasing of a motel, hotel property. Uh, fun fact, the hotel on your slide is currently for sale. Um, I believe it's near Preston, Minnesota, but uh, just <laughs> thought I would share that. Um, and then another activity that uh, was recommended to us by the Department of Health to consider is to establish a respite room or respite rooms for single occupancy, which would ensure access to a private bedroom bathroom should someone um, have COVID or be uh, at risk of, a, of another type of infectious disease. So the timeline, these funds are not currently out for RFP, but we wanted to make sure and get this on everyone's radar as soon as we could to get folks thinking about potential projects and getting kind of ducks in a row to apply. So this will be a competitive request for proposal process. We hope to have that published by the end of November, early December, uh, barring any major obstacles. That RFP will be available on the DHS grants and RFP page for those of you who are familiar. Um, our team will also do our best to make sure we get that administered as well as uh, we'll coordinate with the coalition to get that out once it is published. Two other things I wanna highlight is that we will be having a bidders conference for these funds in mid-December. So while this session is really just a broad overview of the funds, the bidders conference in December will be after the publication of the RFP and therefore some of the specifics that we don't have at this time, we might have then to be able to answer. Um, and so just encourage folks to have that on your radar. We also intend to publish a frequently asked questions document that will be published along with the RFP. Um, that document will include questions that we received today that perhaps we can't answer until the RFP is published, as well as any questions re we receive once the RFP is published. Um, so we wanna make sure that those are out there and available for folks to review as well. The 15 million of the funds included in the total 17 million come with a timeline that is a little bit shorter than I think we would have liked to see for capital money, but projects must be completed and funds fully spent by June 30th of 2023. So again, that's why we're really hoping to get folks thinking about this project now. Um, and then of course we will do our best to move as swiftly as possible through the review process to get contracts in place so providers have as, have as much time as possible to utilize those funds. We do intend to try to pursue um, within DHS allowability to spend back. So even though the contracts might take a while to get in place, we're trying to pursue an opportunity to extend the eligible deadline for reimbursement. But again, we, wouldn't, we won't be able to say that for certain until um, we're in the process of contracts. So again, while we can't provide a lot of the specifics of the application, we do wanna highlight some things to have on your radar as you're thinking about potentially applying or thinking about what would be required to submit. Um, for those of you who have applied with DHS, specifically with the Office of Economic Opportunity in the past, the template and structure will look relatively similar. Of course, the questions will, will differ pretty drastically, but if it's helpful to kind of know the format or have that in mind, it will be similar. We encourage providers to think through and have access to floor plans um, 
to scale of the space that they're intending to renovate and or purchase. Um, providers will be asked to submit photographs of the existing conditions of a space with their application. So something to think through. As mentioned, these funds are very closely tied and focused on um, mitigating infectious disease spread. And so a portion of the application will really ask for thorough descriptions on how the project has been informed by public health guidance, um, you know, local public health, CDC, Department of Health, um, any others you might be connected to. We required that providers offer uh, very detailed cost estimates of the project. We intend to ask folks to build in a contingency fund as well. And so just to as closely as possible have that information and be able to provide a thorough budget narrative of the project will be really important. We also want to make sure providers are thinking through shelter projects that can be responsive to the needs of communities that are experiencing persistent disparities and equities. So including communities of color, um, American Indians, LGBTQ veterans and individuals with disabilities. And so there will be um, requests within the application that people spend some time thinking through and detailing equity and accessibility considerations and for um, special considerations to these specific populations. A last thing to note is that these funds uh, available via this RFP process are not eligible for services and operations costs. So that means that in the application for capital funds, it will be really important that providers are able to detail a funding plan for services and operations, either beyond the acquisition of a property or for ongoing if it's in a property that's just having a renovation. So um, I've probably said this several times at this point, but we definitely just encourage providers to start planning um, those who are interested in pursuing this funding opportunity. So we encourage folks to give yourself plenty of time to read the RFP and to write the proposal. Um, as soon as that's published, making sure to take a look at it, participate in the bidders conference, submit questions. We will do our best to make sure we, we get the appropriate information to you to proceed in your application process. Also to stay connected to the coalition for technical assistance resources. At the start of the conversation, Matt outlined some resources and the, the DLR group and others who are here today can provide some thoughts um, and also just to reach out within your networks or other providers that maybe you've worked with in the past who can really help think through and prepare for the application. And again, just to make sure and, and listen in on the bidders conference and keep your eye out for the FAQs once they are published. We, I actually will pause quick. Francie, is there anything you wanted to add before we go into questions? Uh, no, I think you covered everything pretty clearly, but I know there's a lot of questions out there. So <laughs> let's just get to that. Sure. Uh, so folks from the coalition, I, if you could help us kind of navigate uh, the Q&A. But again, just to, to say that um, I know I mentioned this in the beginning, but we're still working through a lot of the details with the RFP and the contract and just some details of the resources. So if we're unable to answer your question today, uh, we'll do our best to either get back to you shortly or make sure that that's included on the FAQ document once published. Yeah, so if people can either raise your hand or use the chat for questions. Um, did, is there any that stand out already, Francie or um, Caitlin? Well, I see one here from Catherine. Uh, does acquisition include the acquisition of vacant property, property where we will build a new building? So um, I think that's a good nuanced question. So the um, as Caitlin noted, um, these funds are available for acquisition and renovation, not construction, pretty much because of the timeline that we are working under, which as Caitlin said, is not the one, the timeline we had hoped for, but it is what we have. 
So all the funds need to be um, completely spent and the project completed by June 30th of 2023. It's not a lot of time. So we've made a decision that construction is not an allowable activity for, the, for these funds. So you could buy a vacant property and renovate it but not buy um, a vacant property, tear it down and build something new. So hopefully that answers. Okay, I see another question. Like how many awards will be available? Well, there's a good question. <laughs> um, we have no idea what really to expect. I Well, except to say that with 17 million and we've never had funding for this before, I'm expecting there's a huge pent up need. And so I expect that there'll be, that this will be really competitive funding. So the trick is gonna be to, I mean, we're gonna favor projects that can get it and get it done in the time frame. And um, the public health focus is the biggest um, focus that we're gonna have because that's where this is American recovery funds so it needs it has to be well tied to the public health uh the public health uh mitigation issues so make sure that you do a good job in connecting up and i terry you'll be next but i did see there's some comments about day centers and warming spaces did you already address that that's what you're gonna ask too terry sorry linda and rose and i are kind of going on the same um trying to get at the same thing here we, there's very, very few drop-in spaces right now, and some of the drop-in spaces um, aren't um, appropriate for all, you know, for different, for all of our shelter needs. So we're wondering, is, is drop-in going to be included in this RFP process? And if, or, and, 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 and um, Linda, day, day centers, warming spaces, all that kind of stuff. Is any of that going to be included in this particular RFP? And if not, where can we find that? Because that's a huge gap, right? Now. I understand that for sure. And um, Caitlin uh, outlined the um, definition for shelter. Um, I think we are thinking that it's overnight shelter. I don't say that we've made that hard, fast determination, though, because we have, as I say, we've never done this before, so we're making it up with you, um, and uh, we can take that under consideration. However, I think our priority would be overnight shelter. I do, and I know this isn't about the MCH agenda by any means, and Zach, feel free to jump in if you prefer. Um, but in our legislative request in 2022, we are going to include day shelters as eligible for the capital funding that we're going to be advocating for. Zach, anything else you'd add to that? Nope, you covered it. Cool. Cool. Yes. Um, so thanks, Matt, for saying that. We're just talking about this one pot of money that we have going right now. Um, not to say this is ever going to be adequate for anything. We're, we're kind of getting our feet wet um, on this and we're, um, you know, we're delighted to have an opportunity to do anything. So um, thanks, Matt, for, for saying that. Hopefully we'll have future funding that we can do more broadly and more money to do more broadly. I see a more simple question. Uh, could HVAC funding be used for a new building? And, um, I'm assuming, yes. <clears throat> yes, HVAC is a big important part, yes. Mm -hmm. And then just for clarification, could you define what overnight shelter means? And there's an example in the chat does that have to serve people in crisis due to violence or is it more general such as substance abuse, mental illness, et cetera? Caitlin, do you wanna take that one? Sure. So we've just defined overnight shelter as providing basically a space 
some shower, bathroom facilities, meals, etc. And so that's not necessarily specific to a particular population or um, connected to substance use or mental illness or anything like that. I hope that answers the question, but please let me know if it doesn't. And to clarify, HVAC does mean heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Um, and I think some of this stuff is still helpful to just say again, because some folks did join a little bit later. So can the planning, design, or pre-renovation be included <clears throat> in their request, such as environmental studies, architect design fees, et cetera? Um, yes, they are allowable um, and eligible for this. However, um, if the your project is not funded, obviously you wouldn't be able to recoup those costs. That's tough. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, next question: What defines completion? For example, if we ask for planning and design funds, do we just need to complete the planning and design portion of the work, or do we need to also complete and open the shelter? And that's uh, uh, that's been asked a couple times. Yes. Um, so while planning and design is allowable or eligible, um, we are not interested in just doing planning and design. We want to have completed space. So we're, we're saying all that the project needs to be completed and people need to be able to use the shelter. Is there a priority age group for this funding, such as single adults and or families prioritized over youth shelters? Uh, we don't have such a preference, no. We, are, we do have a, um, a thought about having statewide um, programming straight statewide, though, I will say that. Um, and would funding cover demolition of an existing building to allow for a new shelter? Uh, no, because that's construction. And again, a plug into what MCH will be uh, trying to get during the upcoming session, so. Uh, there was a question on the timeline for the RFP, like due dates and contract execution. I don't know if you went into those details or do you have those details yet? Well, we roughly, <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> we have um, the RFP and the contract are being reviewed by our crack legal team as we speak. Um, and so we don't know quite exactly how that's going to go. Again, it's our first time. So we're hoping we didn't make very many um, errors, but um, we're hoping to have this RFP published by the, in November, yet in November, and then uh, applications due end of January-ish. And then um, we would do a, a rigorous review and hope to have contracts ready to go March-ish. And then we could start construction starting in April and you have about, what, 14 months or so to complete the project. So those are kind of rough numbers if everything goes well. That's the plan. Um, and I'll get to the raised hands in just a second, but I'm trying to backtrack in the chat room. Um, and feel free, like we already answered that, but would planning and design include hiring a consultant to complete a fe feasibility study on whether building a new shelter is doable and needed. Uh, again, that's a planning uh, thing, so likely not. All right, All right. and you do not look like Harry, uh, <laughs> but if you wanna unmute yourself and then ask your question. It's being stubborn. There you no, go. This is Mary. Uh, Mary Quingle, here he is at another meeting, but we do have a question. We currently lease the building our center is in. Are we eligible to apply for funding for renovations within that building? Uh, I believe that, no, you would have to be the owner of the building. Thank you. That was a good question. That was a good question. Yeah. Sorry, it wasn't the answer you wanted though, Mary. <laughs> 
Okay, I see some new questions have come in, so I'm going to go to those. Uh, and we do have scheduled till 3.55 for these type of questions, so we're still doing good on the agenda. Okay, so the newest question, are you allocating a specific amount to planning and design? Could easily see a chunk of money being utilized for this and not going to actual shelter projects. Yeah, so we're not going to fund any um, design, planning, design only projects. But if you have a, you know, let's say you have a building and uh, you want to get some help, which, you know, I'm super supportive of, and you have an architecture firm or somebody who's going to help you put some your thoughts together and some make do some planning, that would be that would be eligible as part of the project. But then you have to also do the renovation and get it all wrapped up in a bow by the end of June on 2023. So I, I know what I'm saying here, you guys. I, you know, like a, I did a bathroom remodel and it was like, it took twice as long as I thought. Um, so, you know, we want to be mindful of that. So don't get your eyes bigger than your um, project can be, because um, this is, you know, really a finite, hard, hard stop. And I did check that out thinking, oh yeah, well, maybe there's some wiggle room if we obligate the money. And no, it isn't. It's like that CRF money was, that uh, COVID relief fund money earlier where it had to be spent by December 30, 2020. And that was it. There was no wiggle room. And that's the same way this one is. But it's June 30th, 23. Um, would proposals or projects be prioritized for shovel readiness? Well, they all have to be, you're going to need to convince us on all the projects that they are doable in the time frame. So if you have something that's shovel ready and um, you can hit the ground running, yeah, you're going to have, you know, a good chance of having a really, um, do a really fundable project. But, uh, you know, we don't know any of that. We're just going to know when we get the applications. And just a quick refresher, when's the money available? The money will be available. Well, we're hoping to do the contracts March-ish of 2022 is coming up March. Perfect. So then the funding would be available immediately there. Mm -hmm. um, and Tom, were you just waving to say hi or you, do you have a question? You can unmute yourself if you have a question. You know, I, I'm not really big on chat rooms and, and I um, um, couldn't figure out how to turn my video on until just now, but uh, thank you, Matt, for, uh, for recognizing me. Um, I was wondering, uh, can uh, funds be used to improve accessibility to buildings, bathrooms, soup kitchens, uh, can we use it to help uh, for accessibility of an existing building? Is it a shelter? Is it a, an overnight shelter? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm on the board for the Care and Share in Crookston, Minnesota. Oh, oh. Um, yes. Um, yes, so it, it can be, you would need to um, tie it to the public health emergency. If you can do make accessibility part, um, you know, tied in, strongly with the public health emergency, then absolutely those things can, can happen. Okay, thank you. Nice. Uh, can you please clarify what you mean by programming statewide? Oh, I mean that we wanna fund projects across the state. So this is not gonna be a Metro focus or a greater Minnesota focus. We're going to prioritize try to have a little something across the whole state the best we can. And of course, we only can fund the program, the, you know, the viable projects that come in, but we're going to keep that in the front of our mind. Cool. Is adding on to a current structure an eligible use? No, that's construction. 
Mm -hmm. I checked this out with some architects. So adding on is construction. So it's going to be in the space that you currently have for this pot of money. Again, you know, kudos to the coalition. If we can get some other funding, then we're going to, you know, have at it. And we then would maybe have a priority of expansion. This is a priority for public health and you know, containing infectious disease. I have a follow-up clarifying question even just from, so uh, couldn't there be a case made that adding onto a current structure would be increasing the ability to social distance? You could make that case, but, um, but you know, again, adding on then we um, takes more time. Oh, and okay. I know that not recently, and you know, maybe our architects could weigh in on this, but um, uh, previously I checked that out with some architects and they said, if it's um, construction is construction is construction. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. We're getting lots of questions, this is good. Um, I have a, a question real quick. Go for it, Stacey. Um, so going on that no construction and adding on, I'm still trying to get there. If we purchase like a manufactured house or a manufactured building and just connected it, would that do it or not? Oh gosh, you think there's that one, I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> so um, the... it's not new construction, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> adding it on attaching it <laughs> we will um we'll we'll talk that over and okay get back to you on that one okay and as I thought it was doing so well too <laughs> <laughs> that's one of uh, the benefit of an event like this with a larger turnout like we're thinking of stuff that the collective mind that can come up with that's hard for individuals to do so good questions um, okay, there is a question. Isn't leasehold improvements considered capital expenditures? And then it says under GAAP, it is. I'm not sure what that acronym is. It's Sorry, that's under, <clears throat> I'm an accountant. So that's under generally accepted accounting principles. So, I mean, now like if we do any work to our um, leased properties, you know, let's say we put in a new door and it was $1,500. So we capitalized that. So, and just like kind of am reading. I, am I mute? Jenny, you're not muted. Oof. I'll mute you though. So I was just wondering, you know, because this is a capital grant, I mean, wouldn't that classify under accounting standards? Well, I think we we have been thinking of this funding as um, being for improvements to properties that you own or would own. Okay. Um, I know that with um, with uh, geo bond money, you, there's leasehold kind of stuff, and you know if this is if this gets to be a big issue, I can do some consulting around and and maybe even David has some some thoughts on that, um, but uh, that's the best answer I have at this moment. Gotcha. I, I, we own our shelter, so it, it was more like in reference to a, a previous question. Mm. Yes, right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, what are the match requirements? There are no match requirements to this funding. And I'm going to try to keep it that way and keep that in mind too, Matt, when for your project that we don't want to have a match on there. And the legislature always presses and wants to do that. But, you know, we aren't, um, we aren't rich in these programs. And so that makes it really hard and sometimes impossible. So, um, but for this funding, no match requirement. Hey, Pastor, <laughs> Pastor Sue, do you just mind asking your question? Yeah, this kind of relates to that. Thank you, Matt. Um, so will other sources of funding be considered in the RFP? So what I'm getting at is if we already have identified 
some remodels. We have some funding identified for that, but are looking for, you know, additional sources to cover the gap. Would that be considered as part of financial viability that we do have other sources? Absolutely. Yes, I think that's that's a strength. And Caitlin, of course, has put together a nifty little chart for that. Excellent. That and then one quick follow-up. What about, I know not new construction, but what about extending a second floor over an existing first floor? So you're familiar with Micah's mission. We have talked about, wouldn't it be great to extend the second floor dorm space over the first floor? Um, all right, I'm 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 going on a limb here, and David is listening too, and he's an actual architect. So I am going to say that not that okay. with this money. So okay. if we get additional funding later on, that would be a super thing to do, but not with this money. This money is more about like reimagining your dorm space to yeah. make it safer. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If money is granted, what are the reporting requirements and would they need to participate in HMIS? I, well, Caitlin can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we have an HMIS requirement. There would be a monthly um, financial report and uh, update about the progress of the um, of the project. So the powers that be here in DHS are concerned that um, the projects aren't gonna move along. And so they're gonna be asking the legislature, the governor will be asking, well, are those projects on, on time? So that's why we're putting that in there so we can kind of keep that going. And if a project is gonna fall through, which you know could happen, then we would want to get that funding turned around to somebody else as well, potentially. Are you expecting, are you expecting to offer other rounds of grant making in the future? For example, are you planning on having a grant deadline in 2023? Um, well, we will have that, um, let's see, 2023. What year are we on? We're on 22-23. So no, this will be, we have that $2 million of ESP improvement funding that we will do every biennium. So we will um, not have one in 2023, but at 2 million will be available um, the following biennium. So we would do another RFP at that time and that would be only $2 million. Um, we're hoping that um, your um, ask to the legislature will be successful and that we will be able to do an RFP in the spring or in the summer and um, have some expansion funding, but we have to wait and see on that. And when you say spring, summer, you're referring to 2022, correct? Correct. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. There is a question on scoring primarily around uh, BIPOC communities, cultural competency, uh, and there's some comments around LGBTQ and trans communities. Um, so how will those communities be reflected in the scoring in this work? And so I can't really speak to the scoring at this moment. Um, you'll have to wait for until uh, the RFP comes out, but we do have that information or those uh, that's a section about that uh, for all the responders to answer. So that is something that we're, we're considering, but the specific scoring I can't disclose. Makes sense. All right, how many bids are required? And they give an example, um, for instance, for HVAC updates, do they have to get more than one bid? Well, uh, to that one, I would say you need to follow your own agency practices. Um, if, you're, if you're spending a good deal of money, any homeowner knows that one bid is probably not sufficient. However, in some parts of the state, maybe there's only one viable provider. 
So uh, we don't have any uh, specifics on that, but that might be a question that um, David can answer in the next section. Cool. cool. Yep. And we do have, we just have a few minutes left, but again, we're going to end this info session with final Q and A's. So um, there's a question that I think I think I might even know the answer, but I'll ask just in case. Are severely COVID impacted populations going to be given priority over those not so much? And how will that be measured? Well, um, I would say that all of our homeless population are at risk and that's what this is for. So we don't have a particular, you know, we're not public health people. <laughs> Among the many things we don't know, um, we're not public health people, so we're asking you to determine that, and um, and we look at all of our homeless population as being at risk. All right. Can the same organization submit multiple RFPs for multiple projects? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, there's a comment in here, and it was... <laughs> from Lisa, Lisa Meir. So um, Lisa, feel free to hop in if you need to expand on it. But if these are federal funds, won't it require three bids? Okay, there, see? <laughs> uh, I, do, I do not know the answer to that question. We're gonna be saving this chat <laughs> narrative too. So I'll pull the questions <laughs> okay. for a fact document. Okay. Lisa, is there anything you'd want to expand on that? Or Clearly Lisa's smarter than I am on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, um, I, it was just from like a procure, federal procurement policy um, standard that I, I was wondering if it carried through to these funds. Good catch. All right, not that I'm, the answer to that then is not that I'm aware. Okay. Okay, so, I think I got through all the questions. Apologies if I missed any, but again, uh, just re-ask the question at the end. So right now, um, Molly and David with DLR, um, you are both co-hosts, just so you know. So if you wanna share your screen, you can, uh, but I am going to hand it off to the two of you now. Thanks so much, Matt. I'll start a little bit with an introduction and then introduce some of my colleagues here as well. And, um, and also try to address some of Francie's um, kind of comments along the way as we go through this. Um, I'm an architect and a principal here at DLR Group and um, also a member of the board and um, um, an officer of the Minnesota Architectural Foundation. And so in a most broad sense, I represent our profession as architects, as design professionals who um, are here really to kind of assist and support our own communities. And that's kind of at the core of this. I noticed from Matt's uh, initial um, poll here, about 5% of the attendees are architects on the call. And so I'm really glad to see colleagues of mine, I know from LHB have run on the call here and others who you know, can also assist in the community more, more broadly and can um, really support. Um, we are a very collegial group and we support each other and um, we wanna support our own communities along the way. Uh, as a architecture firm here in Minnesota and based in Minneapolis here, uh, we're committed to um, you know, improving our own communities. And we do that from our traditional architectural role to um, sometimes uh, in offering services for nonprofits and NGOs, and even some of our people here, some of our designers and architects, engineers, are elected officials on uh, councils, on city councils, on our neighborhood improvement groups, and, um, and school boards, and a number of different functions. We have a a strong part of our DNA is built into helping our communities in many ways. And through ongoing discussions with Matt and his crew, um, and having some background and planning for this meeting with Francie and others, we, you know, we felt um, a sense of uh, responsibility and support for helping through navigating through this grant process as best we can. So our purpose here is 
uh, really, really easy. It's, you know, where do you start? Where do you begin? You know, we could be a source to help beginning um, on defining what your project is and how to um, uh, understand and put things into terms that might be suitable for supporting the grant uh, request. And um, we can be a resource here. There were a couple of questions that came up. One was about, um, I, th I think it's really important that this is about a public health improvement uh, grant money. And that's kind of the core and underlying things that we do. And how much is a renovation not considered or considered? And it's a kind of a, um, a tricky question might be each project has to be looked at, but some of the examples that were cited here probably get into whether there's some uh, significant structural improvements. Uh, columns, uh, load bearing walls, roofs, stuff like that are probably gonna be um, outside the realm of what this grant request would cover because they become, even though they're renovations or expansions of that sort, they're probably not within the confines and definition of what this grant request is about. Um, we talk in terms of building systems, mechanical systems, plumbing systems, electrical systems, and structural systems, and um, windows and doors and those kinds of things are architectural sy systems. So those kinds of things, um, when there's multiple systems involved, starts to probably flip into that renovation category that might uh, exceed the bounds of what the definition of this grant request is about. So we, you know, we're happy to kind of address question by question or project by project and see how that might work out. So another question that came up was, you know, is there a minimum number of bids? And uh, Francie answered it just really well because there might only be one or two um, appropriate or valid contractors that might be able to supply a bid in a certain situation. So that again is a little bit dependent on the conditions. I think um, when we look at it and size it all up, the timing from start to completion is a relatively short time. So, you know, taking on something that's manageable and getting it um, um, pulled together from a design and planning point of view, getting um, uh, code and permits through, uh, getting some bids back and then having it implemented and then having a space occupied, it's a relatively short window of time to the end of the uh, close period in order to get that up and running. So taking on projects that um, have, um, you know, are doable in this kind of time frame is an important consideration too for the grant requests. So hopefully I address some of those kind of questions. We can address a few others, but we'd like to share maybe a few different uh, stories, uh, examples, and um, and we have some really talented people who are are here from DLR group that uh, can share a little bit more, amplify a little bit more of some of our background. Uh, with that, I'll have Molly O'Connor from our office here describe a few things. Sure. Hello, everyone. Molly O'Connor. I'm a senior architect here with DLR group. And uh, we have a small group within our firm called Design Agency. We want to make a difference. And uh, I was fortunate in being able to meet Francie and Caitlin, who led us to Matt and the Coalition for the Homeless. So um, should we introduce our other two colleagues or should I go into these examples first? What do you think? We'll go into the examples. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's a good call. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm not gonna share my screen here. So very simply, now when you see the application that Caitlin and her team has put together, there's an opportunity to put photographs. But quite honestly, we, we had this idea that maybe people would be unfamiliar with how to put a document together. And, and, and just to start to describe what your needs are, this is a, a, an apartment building somewhere in Northeast Minneapolis, I believe. It's a pretty nice looking building, but you know, it's quite possible that it needs a new boiler. Um, or in, this is this building, this particular structure is of such an age, it would probably require window units, we think. Um, but so a mechanical upgrade, the windows upgrade, the doors upgrade, maybe there's security upgrades, but um, 
you can do a photograph, you can do hand annotation, or maybe it's possible it sounds like um, MCH might be able to assist in creating some of this stuff and or uh, uh, myself and my colleagues could help create some kind of an application. So then um, I'll move to this. So this is a this is a housing nonprofit. Maybe some of you recognize. And one of my colleagues <clears throat> who's on the call today actually participated with this uh, particular instance. But this this uh, nonprofit had the floor plans for this old building, which was a former convent. So they actually had the floor plan. So it was really helpful for them to understand. But as you might expect, the bedrooms were small. And so the existing conditions, you know, we've got a lot of stuff and people and families that need to fit themselves into these rooms. And so there was um, a listening session. I think there was a documentation ses session, possibly the um, photographs were provided by the facility. Um, and then our typical clients, and I guess this is for mothers and young families, what this particular shelter was for. And so um, our two of our colleagues worked with some students and the students put together um, an idea for a solution. And so, so with looking at these small bedrooms and these cluttered conditions that people are forced to live with, right? The, the idea really starts to become, so this is the concept. It's a furniture solution. And you know, maybe making the best use of the space that you have within your existing facility, that's the kind of creative thinking that we're used to doing all the time. Right, so uh, this is a concept. I think our students probably used some of their, their skills and worked on these renderings or built a model and they, we use our programs to make, create, the, create the images. And while this isn't required for a builder, sometimes it's helpful for the builders to say, oh yeah, I can get there, right? But uh, it's simply, a, it appears to be um, a bed for mother um, and two children or maybe it's mother and child and two more children. And we've got four people sharing this little tiny room. And so the bed is a Murphy bed and folds up. And then during the day becomes a study space. So this is just really a, a very simple solution to a problem with a cluttered space and trying to make the most of the space. And so we can look at that more, but uh, I'd also like to leave space to introduce my friends Claire, my colleague Claire Lonsbury, and then Bryce Aristed. So, Claire, do you want to pipe up a little bit? <laughs> yeah, introduce. You know, I don't have much to add to that except for I'm an architect at DLR Group. Um, I participated in that search for shelter um, project, but I just wanted to know, you know, that's just one example of a, a small design challenge that the organization had and um, simple ways to be able to. Um, propose some solutions so I don't and just ways that it can be graphically represented um, when you bring in some um, a design support um, so that's all I had to add and then Bryce maybe you'd introduce yourself you have you have experience in some of these um, pro bono efforts that we've been working on yeah, I'll I'll say real quickly it's, it's a pleasure to be on this call it's a pleasure to be in a space where uh, we have such a group that is so concerned about um, providing accommodations and help for those who need it most. And um, so, yeah, we, we get a lot of um, energy from you and um, are excited to participate um, in any way we can. Um, I don't have too much to add other than, other than that. Um, thank you for the work that you do. And um, I hope that there's some partnerships that can form between us and between other designers. Um, and really uh, move the needle on homelessness in Minnesota. Yeah, if if I can just jump in quick, I probably should have done a better job introducing you all. Um, but I think having the architects on this call, the goal was not just for the funding that Caitlin and Francie went over, like that's the top priority right now because of the short timeline. But it's also for future projects as well, if we are able to secure more funding. So, uh, I mean, this space is a perfect opportunity to ask questions related to the funding that OEO went over, but the architects 
are also a resource to talk about some more future oriented projects. So I just wanted to lay that out there. Um, and it's just great that architects have such a passion for this and there's a bunch of them. And we could have just given everybody a list of architects, but we want to be able to give a list of architects that have the same desire that DLR does in trying to make a difference. So uh, DLR won't be able to handle all 90 some million dollars that we've identified in potential projects, right? Uh, they'll be able to help some, but that's why we're trying to make a longer list of the architects. Um, so I don't know, Molly, if you want to, if you have other content you want to go over, feel free. Otherwise, we can also use this time for some, uh, about five minutes of Q&A. You know, right. Matt, there, there's some yeah. questions that popped up in the chat box, and we can maybe address a couple of those. Um, Lisa had a question about won't there be, uh, since it's federal funds, won't it require three bids? And we, you know, we go through a lot of different kind of bidding scenarios in which because of its kind of specialty or other things, you know, we try to seek competition in the marketplace for getting things. Uh, we believe that uh, provides good value, but um, sometimes there just aren't any other bidders for kind of some kind of specialty use. And so we try to make accommodations in um, putting a project out there for soliciting bids. And if there's only one qualified bidder, I mean, I, I think everyone on the phone here would agree, we wouldn't want to take uh, a low bid unqualified bidder, um, but uh, we try to do our best in, in uh, trying to seek as much competition in the marketplace as possible. So Francie and Caitlin might have some more uh, specifics on that requirement, but uh, you know, we go through a lot of that ourselves on trying to get um, qualified bidders and sometimes there's not very many. Um, James had a question, a couple of questions actually about understanding it. And um, I, I didn't wanna uh, overstep the sort of notion of what falls into a renovation that wouldn't be covered by the grant uh, based on building systems. I was just using the different kind of building systems as an example. And it seems like some of the questions that came up regarding um, like extensive renovations, I, I think it's probably when it gets to a realm of structural modifications. Um, structures being columns and beams and roof members and floor members, they take on a different kind of tone in terms of what the building is and becomes more of a construction project. Or if it's a retrofit from a mechanical unit that requires electrical pieces and some plumbing in it, that's uh, more of a renovation that uh, does conform within the uh, program uh, requirements here. So um, it's it sometimes is a case by case basis that has to be evaluated about what, um, you know, what the needs are. But um, there are things called building systems. We we work in that realm all the time. It's kind of our, our one of our vocabulary words. And, you know, when we um, look at and size up a project, and it's a, a more extensive project that requires uh, multiple disciplines of work, it's probably going to be in that renovation realm. Um, but that doesn't mean it is always that way. So, you know, sometimes it just takes a case by case um, uh, piece. And then another question that James had was about uh, having formal partnerships with construction and architecture firms. I, I suppose that depends a little bit on what is meant by formal, but it's um, probably as much a case of getting the work done in the short time frame. You know, there's going to be a grant application. The grants will be distributed. So it's probably sometime this spring when you might know that there's money available for um, the uh, scope of work and that definition of what you're going to do. And so it just is going to take a little bit of time. I, I couldn't imagine. And, you know, projects that have identified partners up front that are ready to go right away um, uh, have a better chance not for necessarily winning the bid, but for actually implementing the work right off the bat. You know, if there's a time period in order to solicit uh, proposals from multiple architecture firms, and it goes to multiple construction firms, uh, those all add time to the um, schedule. And that might be something that has to be weighed about uh, having a team in place right off the bat for the uh, grant request versus um, you know, having to do that after the fact. So um, there isn't anything uh, required on that front. It just would seem to expedite the timing involved um, by having some of those partnerships up ahead. 
uh, Michelle had this question about important to clarify the distinction between new construction and eligible renovation costs. And uh, yes, that's a really important thing to uh, 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 try to clarify that distinction. And um, again, that gets into maybe a case by case basis or what might be considered within the scope of, of um, costs covered by this grant versus things that might not be covered. And um, Francie has a better sense, Francie and Kaylin have a better sense of what that line is, you know, like what, um, what might be all uh, covered. Um, the example here was there was an existing space that had daycare bathrooms, but open space when it turned it into five large bath bedrooms and a living space and offices. And um, I, I know Francie has come back on the line. I can see her face. You know, that might be something that you might have a better handle on whether that kind of sc scope of work uh, would be covered in this or if you have some other um, clarifications on that line between major renovations versus um, these kind of improvements we're talking about. Yeah, I was just chatting with uh, Caitlin about that and saying, I hope nobody asked me to make a determination <laughs> about that because I'm out of my element. Um, I would say though, that um, really important is the timeline. So if you're getting into like major structural repairs and that kind of thing, you know, that may be less doable in the time frame. We're going to have a variety of uh, grant reviewers with a lot of different expertise to review these. But remember, when you're writing your application, you're going to need to convince uh, people, the review committee, that this is a viable project and that it has the public health focus and that you can pull it off by the um, by this on this really short timeline. So um, you know you're going to have a variety of people reviewing, and um, so keep that in mind. And Francie, it, it gets to the next question um, that I, I think is uh, um, kind of follows along the same lines of your answer right here. And Milton had a question about elevator repair. And um, you know those kinds of improvements are really helpful and beneficial for the communities that you serve. But uh, in order for it to be considered for this grant request, it has to be framed within the uh, um, public health guidelines. And there could be many reasons why an elevator repair fits public health reasons from accessibility to um, serving food or other kind of conditions that are really important, especially for um, getting accessibility to the different spaces. Um, it could be um, an operational efficiency need on um, you know, a program's pieces, and that probably starts to stretch the bounds of what um, public health concerns are about. So you know, it has to be defined in the terms of what public health is, um, but an elevator repair could, could certainly um, meet those if they were within the public health pieces. And the only thing I would add to that is that um, we only have $17 million, which, you know, can do you hear what I'm saying? Only 17 million. That's a lot of money. I know, but it doesn't stretch very far across the state. So I expect these to be extremely competitive. So do your best when you're when you're making your case here. Yeah. And, and Francie, if I could jump in for a second, I mean, this question about um, adding separate bedrooms, that is something that could be framed within social distancing and keeping family units within family units and not mixing with the general population. So that seems Absolutely. like where we're, where we're headed here, so. So I think we can, we're gonna go till 425. In the final five minutes, we just hope as many of you can stay on as possible because OEO may be part at that time and we'll talk a little bit more about our advocacy. So uh, we have eight more minutes for questions for the architects and for OEO. Um, David, you're doing a great job managing the questions. If you just want to keep doing that, you can figure out if it's something you can answer. I, I, have, a, I have a question for yeah, Thomas. For yeah, you. Thomas raised his hand. Okay, say David, uh, I, I live in Crookston, Minnesota. We have a, a shelter here, uh, Karen Share, and uh, we are five hours away from the city. Um, I don't know if your organization is going to be wanting to come up 
to Crookston. Um, I used to work for the state and I hated driving down to St. Paul. <laughs> but, but anyhow, through your association, your professional organization, do you have a, a network that can identify um, other architectural firms that could um, help us work through this process of do we um, do something to the existing building we have right now? We've got a, a uh, old Catholic uh, grade school that was built in thir 1931, okay? So then we also think, well, maybe we could put an addition on to the rectory that we also have where we have family stay. Or we're talking about, gee, you know, we, we, we probably could build a new building. And, but we are kind of a diverse board. We don't, we all want to explore these things, but we don't have the ability to do so. And so um, can you help us identify architects in our area to work with us? Yeah, most definitely. We, I reached out personally to some colleagues of mine who have um, offices in the outstate manner. Matt had given us a um, you know, kind of advice to see if we can have some people that uh, work outside of the metro area that can be, you know, strong resources and be there in a, in a more direct manner and um, be efficient with people's time and people's, you know, distance and everything else. So um, there are a number of firms that um, I know of that might be uh, well suited and kind of in your area that we can uh, make some recommendations or an intro and see if that can help you. I appreciate it if you could maybe through Matt, give him some information and, yep. uh, that we can get, get a hold of. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, I also saw that Linda had a kind of a, a um, I wouldn't call it complicated, but a, like a really cool idea for um, buying hotels that are shelter safe and COVID recovery, and then changing those into permanent micro apartments. And, you know, overall, the concept is really good. It's probably stretching the bounds of what this particular grant program might uh, cover. And so Caitlin and Francie might be um, like a better suited to be able to address those pieces. And I know there are some other programs that we both mentioned that um, um, maybe there's a different kind of program for that. Well, it is one of the things that I've heard from some of the legislature uh, legislators over the years is like, we don't want to give you money for homeless shelter because we want to end homelessness. So that's about affordable housing and affordable housing. We've been working on that, you know, but it's, it's not moving the needle very fast. So, um, you know, we need both things, but I think if, um, if you had a project um, like to buy a hotel, let's say there's one in your community and you could buy that, renovate it, and then in the and use it for shelter, making the public health case for why this is a good idea, because you'd have individual spaces. You'd want to think through the HVAC and the flooring and all that stuff. But then um, if you could renovate it now and then have it be in the future usable as a studio apartments or whatever that I think you could make that case. I think that'd be a cool case to make. And then we could report that to legislators saying, yeah, give us more money. Because look, we're also doing, I don't know, <laughs> maybe that's a stretch, but uh, but I, you know, I, I certainly would consider that project. I think the hotels, any hotels that might be for sale could be good uh, solutions if we could make the numbers work. So and the I, yeah. yeah, if I if I can just hop in quick here, because there was a couple of questions we got in advance, so I want to honor those questions. Um, can funding be retroactively awarded? And the example is if a shelter needs to find a new home for their programming, and if they acquire a location in March 2022, but the funding's not available until June, would the project be eligible? Uh, well. Yes, but then if the project isn't funded, then, you know, so yes, I mean, you're taking a chance that it would be funded. And again, it's going to be super com uh, competitive. Right. And then any idea what the award size range will be, I'm guessing <laughs> per project. Yeah, we're not, we're not saying we have 17 million. I'm expecting we're going to have some smaller projects and some 
larger projects and we again first time we've done it so i don't know uh, we haven't really no idea what to expect okay but we don't have any limitations on that except we probably wouldn't fund somebody with all the money okay yeah that makes sense <laughs> that would not be good no i'm sure you'd <laughs> hear about it too so yeah. um with there's a couple minutes left i don't know david molly francie caitlin any final words uh that you'd like to share I, I, I would want to, oh, you go, Caitlin. Oh, You're going to okay. say the same thing I was going to say. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone for your time in this conversation and to the coalition, of course, for facilitating this. Um, moving forward, if you have any specific questions about the OEO funds, you can send those my way. Um, I'll throw my email in the chat in case you don't have that. And, uh, and I would add, um, start thinking and planning now and get your ideas together. David, Molly, any final words? You know, my colleague Molly is really good at kind of wrap up and everything else. And uh, uh, she's <laughs> never shy for words. So uh, Molly, I uh, wanted to give us a send off. Oh, my goodness. I wasn't expecting that, but the, okay. Uh, I, I'd like to echo what Bryce said, that it's very nice to share space with all of you people doing such good hard work and taking care of our community. So thank you for those words, Bryce, and thank you to all of you doing this effort. Um, this is an exciting opportunity that I think, um, and then couching your, your, your requests in the public health, health focus, I think, is going to be key to winning, uh, winning an award and gaining those points. This is interesting. I've never done this point system. I've done different kinds of point systems with existing buildings, um, but that's another story. So uh, uh, with that, I imagine there'll be more questions and Matt's probably going to end up uh, uh, asking us for help with his frequently asked questions that come up afterwards. So um, we'll assist in whatever way we can. All right. And so thank you. Yeah, thank you a ton, OEO and DLR and the other architects and all the work, obviously, the advocates are doing here. So OEO, feel free to hop off uh, at thank this you. time. Yep. DLR, you're welcome to hop off too if you want. But I, I'm curious if there's other architects that are interested in showing up. I just would like to see who else is here. Yeah, maybe uh, Terry's it, here. Terry's from LHB. Oh, excellent. Hi there. Hi, Terry. <laughs> Hi. Hey, one one message to add to this. Um, given the tight time frame, the concern that I have is what we're experiencing on many projects, which is a supply chain delay. So ordering materials has added like two or three months to many of our rehab projects. So get those ideas in early and <laughs> get the planning done early so you can make commitments and um, order materials. Right. Really good Thank point, you. Terry. Thank you. Yeah. So um, Rhonda, I see uh, you turn your video on. Did you want to say anything? No. Well, not in particular, but just a thank you to everybody on the call. And um, I'm, I'm sure Matt's going to talk about advocacy, but we wouldn't be sitting here together talking about this opportunity to deploy $17 million to make spaces more healthy um, for folks experiencing homelessness and bringing people inside. So I just want to thank everybody for your continued efforts, your hard work, um, and just working together with us. We're um, so grateful for your partnership. You're getting some hand claps here too. So thank you for that. So I am just going to quickly share my screen here. Um, and okay, so I just want to highlight some of the things. Um, there we go. Okay, so what to expect as we look towards 2022. Uh, first of all, MCH has been doing really intensive outreach to try to get a really comprehensive needs assessment of different projects. So we do have a survey. Uh, this PowerPoint will send out and I'll send the survey link again. But if you have a potential project, we'd love for you to fill that out. So we're asking for the right amount of money. Um, 
And that leads into, we are going to be advocating for more shelter capital funding in 2022, which we've been talking about. It's a bonding year, it's a great year to do it. If we had a bit more time, we'd probably dive a little bit more into it, but we will in the future. Uh, what you can expect from MCH, we're gonna keep you all informed on some of the resources, such as different funding resources. There's a lot of different moving pieces out there. So we'll send that out if we hear of funding and then support. And when I say support, it can just be like MCH offering advocacy support, but also the architectural support from context that we're reaching out to. Uh, but then we're, out, we're also gonna keep you informed on our shared advocacy. So there might be options for testifying, writing letters of support, answering questions from legislators. I know our director of public policy, Zach, gets a lot of tough questions. So it's really helpful to have key leaders in each region of the state to be able to answer those questions. And then we also have our communications, our communications director, uh, Matt Diaz, they do an amazing job with messaging, but we still need to be grounded in the statewide need. So, and then also we just like to highlight your projects, right, in the broader community through social and earned media. We want to build the narrative as soon as, but we have been for quite a while, but we want to keep building that momentum. And then if you haven't been getting emails from me about this, just shoot me an email. My email is pretty easy, matt at mnhomelesscoalition.org, and I'll add you to my list. So I also do just want to put this slide up here. I think the first three Positions are self-explanatory, engagement, general questions, policy, communications. Uh, but I do want to offer Zara a chance uh, to just give a little introduction to what she does and why you might want to reach out to her. So go for it, Zara. Um, so my name is Zara. I am the regional experts organizer here at MCH. I do a lot of work very closely with our group of folks with lived experience of homelessness across the state known as the Regional Expert Network. Um, and then I also focus on some of our organizing in the seven county metro. So feel free to reach out to me anytime if needed. Perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna stop sharing and with that, oh, and look at that, it's exactly 4.30. So if you asked question, if you weren't able to ask a question, you can email that to me and we'll be sure to put that into our frequently asked questions document. So thank you. This was an amazing turnout. Lovely to hear and see all of you. Have a good day.